Uh, first, I just want to say thank you for letting me be a part of this. Um, I, I, it would not be a strange thing to start by saying that energy is everything, and everything is both positively affected by energy, and the world is falling apart at the same time. Um, so I'll just start by, since it's been outed that I'm a Texan, uh, I'll start by talking about that for just a moment. So uh, in Texas, w our, the Texas economy is the size of the Saudi economy, um, and our population is the same as Saudi Arabia, so our GDP per capita is the same as Saudi Arabia. And that can't be a surprise because, of course, uh, Texas' alternative name is oil. Um, the United States of America is the largest energy producer on the planet, and, of course, the largest energy consumer. Um, and the largest polluter, <coughs> and Texas is one-third of the energy production in the United States. So Texas is at the heart of it. But not just oil, we also do wind. Um, we are the pioneers for wind in the United States, and a huge portion of our electricity comes from that. Having said all that, um, <coughs> we've just had the worst ever summer. Uh, I think it was 100 days at 43 degrees in a row, so we're like Bahrain now, or, or Dubai, uh, it's in, which is, of course, ironic. And um, we've also just now had three winters in a row where we've lost power for days at a time, so our power grid is awful. Um, <coughs> the three winters ago, uh, it was about 10 days, Texas was completely shut down to the point where we were completely paralyzed, like nothing happened for 10 days and we came 43 seconds away from breaking our electrical grid. What I mean by that is, if we had allowed the situation to devolve any further, we were gonna reach a point where <clears throat> we were facing three months without electricity because we were gonna break all the equipment in the grid. And so instead, we did this emergency shutdown, and everybody in Texas just about lost the power, their power for at least some portion of time. So here we are, we're the capital of energy. <laughs> and we can't make it work. And that's the winter. In the summer, we run out of energy because the air conditionings are on so high, because our temperatures have been so high, that we've become notorious for unreliable energy. So even while the rest of the United States has generally good energy, the, the producer of energy in the United States doesn't. So I'm coming into this with a little bit of uh, bitterness and frustration. <clears throat> But also, I, it's worth pointing out, I'm an oil baby. My parents met in Aramco in Saudi Arabia. Had they not been working for an oil company, the odds of them meeting was pretty much zero. So I exist because of oil. Uh, at one point, my father <coughs> was put in a magazine in the 1960s as being the, one of the three most important geophysicists actively in oil exploration. So it's not, energy isn't just a thing that I'm surrounded by, it's also a little bit personal. So I just thought I'd put that out there. So I've been asked to do a talk about the history of energy. And the first thing that popped into my mind was, that's what our species is. We could have been called Homo sapiens energy, or Homo sapiens industria, or something like that. Because we did something with energy that isn't just simply laptops and cell phones. We did something that goes all the way into our evolution. We evolved in, in East Africa. East Africa was notoriously unstable climate-wise. It would go from swamp to grasslands to desert to jungle in thousands of years instead of hundreds of thousands of years or even millions of years. In other words, the, the ecology kept changing, it changed quickly, and it changed extremely dramatically. What that meant was it put all species living in the area under enormous stress because they would have to keep physically adapting to keep up. And then what our species did was not do that. Our species realized somehow genetically through ev the evolutionary process that if we kept adapting physically, changing our diet, changing our, our physiology for the environment, we would go extinct. Many of the species that lived in East Africa would just simply move in after the environment would change because they were in the area, and then they'd just go extinct when the environment would change again. And the way we did it was we grew the bigger brain. Now, obviously, when you look at the political situation on the planet today, it's clear we don't use it. But, but in the beginning, anyway, there was hope. There was hope. I'm a political scientist, 
So I'm bitter and angry all the time because I study corruption and incompetence, right? That's what I, I, I didn't know that. I thought I was studying power and the way to change the world and make a better place. I would have never done this. I'd have done physics or something instead. Art history, it would have just made my, my life happy, but no. Anyway, so <clears throat> we had to do four things to grow the bigger brain. Well, to make this work, because it wasn't just four things to grow the bigger brain. We needed to do four things to make this work. One of the things that we needed to do was increase our caloric intake. So we're supposed to do about 320 calories a day for the brain. Again, as a political scientist, it's obvious we don't use those calories, but that's what's supposed to be there. Well, if, if I could have done 200 less calories on my brain, if we're supposed to consume 1,600 a day, make that 1,400, right? I'm basically, every human being, by having a bigger brain, is potentially eating enough food for one-seventh of another person. This is an enormous increase in the amount of calories our species needed. Think of how lean animals are and how hard it is for them to get from being a baby to reproducing and then add this, this amount, one-seventh more caloric intake just to make it so you have a slightly smarter being. So the first thing we began doing, because also you have to remember, we're prey. We were herbivores. And so the first thing we began doing is we began supplementing our diets with meat. Now, we're small, we're not fast, we don't have the teeth for it, we don't have the claws for it. We're not predators, we're not evolved to be predators. So to do the meat, we probably had to scavenge. And we were eating the leftovers the hyenas left behind or, or, or whoever else had just finished that animal. So that's the first thing we did, because meat gives you calories fast. The second thing we needed to be able to do was tools. And the fact that we went to upright walking made it so that we had the ability to use our hands to not only carry the tools, but use the tools as we're moving. But by going to being bipedal, we made ourselves even slower, right? Because if you're a quadruped, you can move a lot faster. So we've taken physic, our physical attributes out of the equation. We're going to problem solve our way to this position that we're in right now. So maybe solve is a wrong word. We're going to create problems and then manage the problems until we get to this point right here, using our brains, not our bodies. Then the next thing we needed to do was grandmothers. So our species is unique. There's three species that do this, killer whales, elephants, and humans. We do grandmothers. All other species on the planet, the females are fertile until the moment that they die. In our species, our females intentionally go offline, along with killer whales and elephants. And the reason is this. Information is so important in our species. It's such a huge core chunk of what we do that we needed to be able to have a population of people who were filled with wisdom, who were capable of uh, passing that wisdom on, that we intentionally took the most important ability, when you think about it, reproduction, what other ability in survival is there that's more important than that, and we went, okay, these grandmothers have all this wisdom and knowledge, they need to be around to pass it on, childbirth is too dangerous, let's take them offline and put them into the educating process, which is why, of course, misogyny is stupid, because evolution has made women live an extra 10% longer than men because they're more important. So, having said this, <laughs> the fourth step is, the, of course, the step you wanted to hear, fire. A million years ago, Homo erectus began using fire. At that point, we were using energy in a way that only maybe two other living things on the planet did. Honeybees, of course, take energy and they store it in a hive, effectively creating a battery, an energy battery to get through the winter. And then the other thing is uh, fungus. The mycelial networks in a forest transmit energy from tree to tree, and they can store energy, and they do something that's really incredible, and we don't have time to go into that, so I'm going to just leave it there, move on. We took energy and we directly applied it to food with fire. The reason we did this and the reason we needed to do this is cooked food, we can access the calories faster so we can grow a bigger brain. So each of these steps, every time we do something, 
our, our brain capacity grows. And as a result, we get a little bit smarter, but now we're actually taking wood and burning it to make ourselves that much smarter because we can get to more calories and we can grow a bigger brain. And it's a feedback loop. <clears throat> the next big leap, of course, is agriculture. Agriculture is all about energy because what we're going to do there is we're going to access the calories in plants in a way that we manage the growth of those plants or animals if we're doing herding. Prior to this, right, we were gathering and hunting species. Looks like Homo sapiens was around 450,000 years now. So for those of you who are like me and you were raised thinking it was 200,000 years, we've now found a skull that's 375,000 years old in Morocco. So I'm told it's 450,000 years. We didn't start doing agriculture until 12,000 years ago. So what were we doing for 438,000 years? Right? If, if Homo sapiens sapiens from 450,000 years walked into this room right now, in terms of intellectual ability, they'd be pretty close to us. Now, there are, we have been evolving over that 450,000 years, like a lot of the symbolic ability that we have. There were specific mutations that we've had in that time period that allowed us to do things like written language and symbol sets that maybe they wouldn't be able to do. But for the most part, their capacity, their problem-solving capacity would be about where we are. In other words, the first time they were harvesting seeds, dropped some on the ground, said, that's okay, grabbed another batch, came back the next year and saw that those seeds had germinated and turned into plants, they should have made the connection to, oh, I could do this on purpose. Agriculture is amazing, let's do it. And it's not. Agriculture meant an actual reduction in the quality of our lives. This is one of the problems that I think our species hasn't figured out yet. Just because there's a new technology doesn't mean it'll be an improvement in the quality of our lives. Email, for example. Who in here actually thinks email has made your life better? Nobody's raised their hands. <laughs> so, just, just as a point, the transition to agriculture took thousands of years. So Egypt is the second place to do agriculture, Iraq was first. The reason you do agriculture isn't because of the amount of energy that you get per calorie spent, it's the amount of energy you get per acre. In other words, you can, you can hold a larger population doing agriculture, but the amount of energy you get in return for effort isn't, isn't meaningful, the change isn't there. So in gathering and hunting, I'm constantly moving. My goal is not to alter the ecosystem. As soon as I start to have an impact on the ecosystem, my goal is to back away and move to a new location. Agriculture is the opposite. My goal is to terraform, it's to destroy, it's to change the ecosystem, to create a monoculture, so the same plant over and over again in the same spot, to keep all the animals out of the area so that they're not competing with me and eating my own food. <clears throat> and then to make things worse, my survival relies on the piece of land that I planted, so if my neighbors get hungry and they want to come take it, violence is now on the table. There could have been violence before this, right, with gathering and hunting. This is my water hole. I need to be here. But, right, you can just leave. You don't have to do violence. But now, if I leave my farm, I die because I run out of food. And so switching to agriculture meant a serious reduction in the quality of our lives, including not having teeth. If I take two stones to grind grain, I didn't just grind the grain, I also ground the two stones. The food that I eat now is basically sandpaper, and I'm not going to have teeth after 30, right? And so there's, there's this serious change that happens. So why would we do it? <clears throat> so I told you Egypt did it second. So a little bit more than 11,000 years ago, Egypt began doing agriculture. By 5,000 years ago, so when the Egyptian state first came into being, that's a 6,000-year span of time. Egypt had become 60% reliant on agriculture for its caloric intake. In other words, 10% every 1,000 years. The transition from a gathering and hunting society in a person's lifetime, if you lived 100 years, would be, you wouldn't see it. You wouldn't notice. Oh, yeah, back when I was 10, 90 years ago, we hardly did any work. No, it was about the same. And so that, what happened was we sort of, eased into this new way of life. But the simplest form of agriculture required energy. And the reason was this, there were no plows. So 
how do I get rid of the grass in my field? I can't just plant my plants in a grassy field. The grass will compete my, my plants out. I got to get rid of the grass. You can't set it on fire. I mean, I've tried. Instead of mowing a lawn, because Texans are obsessed with having really short lawns, so they, they water their lawns in the, in the summer when we're in drought, and everything would just die if you just let it. And then they mow it, adding to the global warming. And then, because their lawn isn't growing the way they want to, they go get factory-produced fertilizers and pour it all over the lawn, and they buy a tractor to mow their lawn, and they don't grow a crop in their lawn, and it drives me crazy. So I have tried setting my lawn on fire. It doesn't work. It just doesn't. So what we did was we would let our farms reforest, and then the trees would shade the grass out. Then we got to get rid of the trees. What we do is take a stone, make a sharp edge on it, and we cut the bark all the way around the tree, cutting off the water supply to the tree. And then the next year, the tree is dried up and dead. Then we set the forest on fire. We plant the seeds directly into the ash, pray for rain, do a dance, of course, to make the rain gods do it. And then the next thing you know, we've got a crop in the field. In about two, three years, the grass will have taken over again. So you abandon that field, let the trees grow back, and go burn another field. In other words, agriculture and energy are inextricably tied together. So, <clears throat> the next big leap for energy and what we do as a species, of course, doesn't actually take. Well, it kind of does. Um, and actually, before we do that, yeah, I'll just jump into that leap first. So about 2,000 years ago, the inventor Heron in Alexandria, Egypt, made a steam engine. And the really amazing thing, of course, about that is we don't really start using the steam engine and steam engine technology until 300 years ago. So for 1,700 years, that technology had been invented and nothing happened with it. And then a guy named Takia Dean in the Ottoman Empire reinvented the steam engine a little bit less than 500 years ago. And then that didn't take. And then we did it again 300 years ago, and that time it took. So what was going on there, and my argument would be the same thing with agriculture. We had the technology, we just didn't know how or why we would apply it. It was there and it was dormant. But there was another reason for that. What, we've done with, what we did with steam engine was we replaced human labor. So in other words, another form of energy and another way in which we use, have used energy was to exploit other people's labor. And of course, the primary way to do that was slavery. And so slavery ends up playing a huge role in our species' development and the civilization that we live in now and all the civilizations on the planet because it became a way that you could extract the energy of another person, utilize the product or the services that they provided, and not actually have to pay for the energy. So that's where the, where the creation of money comes in. When you think about what money is, it's not just a way of establishing value for a good or a service, it's a representation of a person's labor. It's a representation of their physical and mental energy. It's their physical and mental energy times the time they spent. So if you paid somebody uh, $15 an hour, you're telling them that their energy, their time is worth $15, right? And then if you paid another person $150 an hour, you're literally telling that person you're worth 10 of those. And then, of course, what's the actual value of that $15 an hour person's labor? It's probably $150, and the corporation is just cheating them out of the rest of their labor because that's the economic system that we have. It, the idea, of course, is at least it's not slavery where you're paying them nothing an hour and feeding them. But once we have coins, about 2,670 years ago, the coins were uh, developed for the first time in what is today Western Turkey. Once we had that, we could now establish what the value of that labor was. And so in a really strange way, what a coin was, was it was a representation of a person's personal energy. If I come back and I spend $100 for something and I'm paid $10 an hour, I'm literally giving you 10 of my hours. So, steam. 
The original application for steam, we are told, in the Industrial Revolution is uh, transportation. And it was, right? Originally ships, then eventually it'll go over to, to trains. But for me, the more interesting application <laughs> happened about a little bit over 200 years ago was the conveyor belt in the factory. Until then, because factories had been along before the Industrial Revolution, uh, English historians decided to pretend they invented factories. The Arabs invented factories somewhere between 750 and 800 AD. And all the factory was originally was a place where you had a table and an assembly line. So you could streamline production, make production more efficient. The quality of the good at the other end won't be as good as if you just had an artisan do it from front to end, but you could mass produce and you could make a cheaper product and you could, you could get a larger population of customers. What the English did was they took steam and applied it to a conveyor belt. And the reason why that was such an amazing innovation was up until then, the, conveyor, the assembly line could only work as fast as the slowest worker, right? Because that worker is doing this part, they pick up their good and they set it next to them, then the worker next to them does their part, pick up their good and set it next to them. If I have a conveyor belt, Everybody has to work at the speed. The manager sets the speed of the conveyor belt at. It took the workers' only autonomy in the assembly line, their ability to set the pace of the table, away from them and handed it over to the, ma the managers. In other words, one of the great amazing things about our relationship to energy is it has the capacity to liberate, but it also has the capacity to oppress. And, and that's exactly what we mean when we talk about the Industrial Revolution. It's when capitalism takes the factories and utilizes the excess labor in Europe because European mortality levels had dropped, but their fertility rates hadn't, and their population exploded, and there was only a certain pace at which we could slaughter Native Americans and steal their land at, and a certain pace at which we could get English across the Atlantic at. And so as a result, there was all this surplus labor, energy just waiting to be tapped. And the industrial system took advantage of that. It was catastrophic for the worker class, but it of course built enormous English wealth, especially as the English sought to conquer the planet. <clears throat> Since I brought up conquering the planet, one of the fun stats that I like is India's share of the global GDP in the 17th century was 23%. So when I say India, you think up and coming, right? But poor still. 23% of the world's GDP in the year 1600. That's what India owned. When India got its independence right after World War II, it was 4% of the world's GDP. What the English did was they transferred India's GDP to the British Empire. Isn't that incredible? Makes you wish you could do empire again, don't it? <clears throat> so, well, it'll happen. It's just how and what will that shape? Because every, every empire is shaped a little bit differently. Um, all right, the next piece that I want to talk about is, of course, oil. And I've left aside the big chunk of my time for oil because oil, of course, it's not everything, especially now, because we're seeing the transition. Like in Texas, if you go to West Texas, there's windmills everywhere. A huge portion of our energy is, is not oil anymore, even in Texas. Texas, the conservative oil state. We, we actually have a three-person oil institution that we elect every four years that runs oil. Um, it's called the Railroad Commission. I know what you're thinking, and it must run railroads too. It literally doesn't. It just does oil. In Texas, the Railroad Commission is responsible for oil. The Department of Transportation does railroads. So, so if you want to look this up and it's confusing to you, welcome. Welcome. I just, just wanted to clarify. So, all right. Uh, for the record, well, actually, you know what? Before I do for the record, I'm just going to start in 1861. There's a group of businessmen in Pennsylvania. They get this really interesting idea. And the idea is that you might be able to get oil directly. Like you could just go get it. And then oil would replace 
sperm, whale, blubber, and creosote. And you could light your houses at night with oil. And they decide the place they want to look is Oil Creek, Pennsylvania. So for the record, Oil Creek was its name when they decided to look for it. So when we talk about the, the discover, discovery of oil, <laughs> it was already clearly discovered because they knew that there was oil there. The reason was is the creek ran through a, an oil field, and of course oil floats, so it flo it's sitting there at the top of the water, and you could see the sheen of it, and that's how the creek got its name. What these guys did was they convinced some investors to go to the side of the creek and dig a well, like you would dig a water well. Shovels, picks, they went and they began digging, and eventually they hit oil. So it worked. They got the oil they wanted to. The problem is timing. Timing is everything. They did it in 1861. We decided we were going to murder each other wholesale, and we did a civil war, which, uh, by the way, I'm against. If anybody was wondering what my position on civil wars, I really think they're, they're a terrible idea. Uh, you should avoid them. In any case, it made it so that the business opportunities that they were looking for weren't there, and they really didn't do w well at first. But after the Civil War, there's an economic boom around oil. It was initially used in the United States to power lighting at night. So you just put it in a lamp and you'd burn it. Actually, at one point, we would put it in a jar, a little bottle, and if you had a stomach ache, you would drink it but I think they decided that was, it was better to just burn it and not actually drink it. I'm assuming that it would kill you slowly and then you wouldn't have a stomachache anymore. I'm, I'm not sure what the logic there was exactly, but I'm th or it would make you have more stomachache and then you'd drink more. I don't, I don't know. It feels like a, not a great idea though. In any case, the United States will eventually start to get dominated by one company, Standard Oil. John D. Rockefeller creates a, a corporation at a time, by the way, when the United States didn't actually have much room for corporations. So you think about the role that corporations have on our planet today. Um, <clears throat> when Standard Oil was created, the, its first contract was only for one year. It could only exist for one year, and it could only exist in the state of Ohio. It couldn't operate anywhere else. And then Rockefeller had to every year renew his corporation because the United States wasn't sure we wanted to do corporations. And of course, men like Rockefeller eventually became so rich and so powerful that they paid the politicians to change the laws to allow the corporations to become what they are today. In any case, Rockefeller will eventually create an, an oil empire that takes over 95% of the US oil industry, 95%. Across the Atlantic, there are two oil companies, Royal Dutch, and Shell. And Royal Dutch, of course, discovers oil in the Dutch East Indies. Shell was originally an antique dealer. I, I'm still a little clear how an antique dealer became an oil company, but they did it. And I just want to applaud that. I think that's kind of interesting and strange and wonderful at the same time. But they get bought by the Dutch. And the Dutch end up with 51% uh, of Royal Dutch Shell. When that happens, the English go into panic mode. And the reason the English go into panic mode is they realize that even though the Netherlands and them have a great relationship, and the United States and them have a great relationship, they don't have control over a corporation that does oil. And they're starting to think in the late 1800s that oil is the next coal. They've, they've, they've figured it out. They're pretty, especially after Daimler invents the internal combustion engine, they're pretty sure that oil is going to replace coal. So the English go into panic mode because they need to have their own oil company. It's not okay to leave this with just allies. The way we used to find oil at the time is you'd walk. You'd go for a walk and you looked at the ground. I still, I do this, I don't know about you. I always look at the ground, mostly because I'm gonna trip if I don't, but also because you never know what you'll find on the ground. And I think my instinct, since my dad was into this, was, is to find oil, I'm not really sure. And so uh, you look at the ground, and the reason you're looking at the ground is you're looking for black shale or black limestone, those are porous rocks, the raw oil would absorb it like a sponge, and it would flip it black. 
<clears throat> in the process, though, you're going to do this for the whole planet? The British are going to send out armies of people walking, looking at their feet? I mean, they're, co they're trying to conquer the planet, sure, but they have a limited amount of human power to go off and conquer India, go off and conquer Egypt, subjugate the native population of Australia, you know what I mean? Like, slaughter Native Americans in Canada. There's, a, there's only so much they can do. So they decided to do something that Americans haven't figured out, but I, I think the rest of the world actually has, and that was go read a book. And the, their goal here was to find references to oil usage in the past. They figured if we can figure out who was using oil in history, then we would know where to go look for it, because they must have had it. And they found it pretty quickly. It didn't take them long. And the answer was the Middle East. If you had a satellite that you could launch backwards in time and put into orbit at, so it was always nighttime on planet Earth, and go a thousand years back, so make it 1023, the whole planet would be pitch black except the Middle East. The cities in the Middle East would twinkle like they do now, maybe not as bright though. And the reason is, is because the Arabs were taking oil and piping it through their cities to oil lamps, and they had oil lamps light up their streets at night. And the English went, that must have been a significant amount of oil if they were doing this every night. There must be oil in the Middle East. We need to start figuring out how to get to it. And that's what starts this focus, this hyper-focus on the Middle East. Also, just for the record, the Romans, uh, <clears throat> you, you would say, some of you might say Byzantine Empire. There was no such thing. It didn't exist. Please stop saying that. It was the Roman Empire. Say late Roman Empire if it makes you feel better. The late Roman Empire. There, I'll do it, just to make you feel better. Um, figured out how to make flamethrowers, and they sank uh, the Arab Navy twice using flamethrowers. Um, they did have petroleum in the flamethrowers. Uh, Arab armies would take a glass sphere that was hollow, they would put oil in it, they'd drop a wick in it, and they'd light it, and they'd throw them in combat, and they basically made Molotov cocktail, Molotov cocktail grenades that they would hurl at the other side. So the English are reading this going, okay, <laughs> we know where to go. In 1900, the, um, the, the um, clans that were in the Ottoman Empire in what is today Kuwait had been trying to push back against their Turkish rulers for a few decades. The English decided to move into Kuwait and help the Kuwaitis liberate, liberate themselves from Ottoman rule because they, they were already in Bahrain and Qatar, they were already in what is today the UAE, but they wanted a little bit more because they wanted to be closer to Iraq and Iran. Uh, Iraq obviously didn't exist at the time, it was part of the Ottoman Empire, but that's where they're thinking they're going to find the oil. So in 1900, they go into Kuwait, help the Kuwaitis get their independence from the Ottoman Empire, and within uh, four or five years, a Brit named Darcy manages to make a deal with the Persians over oil. And they create the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. It'll eventually be renamed the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company. When they find that oil, the rulers of Iran at the time were these opium heads uh, named Qajars. And, the, of course, the English Empire, for those, or the British Empire, for those of you who don't know, was the world's first ever drug dealer empire. It started with tobacco and then eventually moved up to opium. And so they just went to the Qajars and they went, we'll keep the opium flowing if you sign this contract. And the contract gave the British an 84% concession over all the oil they found in Persia. 84% is, of course, outrageous. Usually it's 50-50, right? It's your resource, but we're pulling it out of the ground. We'll split it. And the Qajars were not good at making intelligent decisions, so they signed this 84% concession. In 1905-1906, Iran becomes a democracy. The British can't have that, because if they do become a democracy, one of the things that could happen down the road is that they'll vote to force England to renegotiate that 84% concession and make it something like 50-50. <laughs> and so the British call up the Russians, and the two, st the two empires invade Iran with the intention of overthrowing the democracy, and they do. They pull it off, 
Iran will go through multiple transitions, um, but its democracy is taken out. The Qajars get overthrown. Uh, Reza Shah replaces them. In 1950, he, he's taken out by the British. In, in 19, don't worry. Like, if you work for the Brits, they will get you eventually. Just heads up. Um, <clears throat> In 1950, Iran becomes a democracy again. And this time, the Prime Minister Mossadegh throws the British out preemptively so that they can't just go in there and overthrow the democracy a second time. So the British approach uh, President Harry S. Truman and ask the United States to overthrow the Iranian democracy. And it's a really interesting ask because of what had just happened. So, pull the clock back six years. It's December 1944. World War II is winding down. It's so bad by December 1944 that logical, rational people would have surrendered a long time ago. But the Germans and the Japanese are <laughs> thinking they're still in this war. They're not, it's over. It's been over for months, but that's not the mentality. So what do the Germans decide to do five months before they surrender? One last great hurrah offensive. You're the defender, you don't do offensives. You're supposed to re hold onto your resources and, and defend, but not the Germans. They decide, we're doing it again. They take all their best equipment all of their best soldiers. They're bringing all their SS divisions from the Eastern Front, and they're putting them on railroad tracks and running them to the Western Front, which wasn't a very long distance anymore because the Russians have already taken Poland, right? The, Germany, the, German, the Nazi empire, to be clear, not the German, but the Nazi empire by this point is really skinny. And so they've got Tiger, Tiger Ones, Tiger Twos, Panthers, three of the best tanks ever made and SS divisions that have battle-hardened fighting the Soviets in this bitter war. Because up until this moment, when the United States invaded France on June 6, 1944, up until December, the Germans were using their worst equipment and their worst units to fight the United States. The, 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 they, they, they were keeping us to capturing like a quarter of a mile a day using their worst stuff. So they're thinking, if they take their best and hammer us as hard as they can, maybe they can punch a hole in our lines, maybe convince us to quit the war, they've got this thing. Because then they can take all that equipment and fight the Soviet Union without having to fight us at the same time. So, they attack. It's called the Battle of the Bulge. It's called the Bulge because a bulge forms in the line. The bulge is because the German equipment, the German soldiers, with all their battle-hardened experience, the American military disintegrates. It's a catastrophe. The U.S. Army did not hold up against the Germans. The Germans punch a line that goes into Belgium. The German goal was to get the English Channel, cut the British and French and American free forces fighting in the Netherlands off from the rest of the army, and then attack that in this pocket with the hope of destroying it because they were convinced we'd quit the war if they hurt us badly enough. And, and as you watch, as, they were, as our generals are watching our lines disintegrate, we're starting to wonder, maybe, maybe this is happening. Maybe they're gonna get to the English Channel. Like, maybe we can't stop them. There was one U.S. unit, just for the record, that didn't disintegrate. It was the 82nd Airborne at Baston. So I just... But everything else is gone. So the Baston becomes this isolated pocket, completely surrounded by the German military as it's heading the English Channel. How did we win the Battle of the Bulge, you ask? They ran out of oil. They had the best tanks. According to the United States Department of War, we call it the Department of Defense today because we're liars, but back then we were honest, so we called it the Department of War. There's such a beauty in that. What's your department? War, right? Like, I mean, it's just clean. Defense, defense, when was the last time we were attacked? 1812? Like, what do you mean defense? We don't have a defense, we do. It's called the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. Try to get to us. What are you gonna do? Forget about it, it's not gonna happen. Just, <laughs> we're, we, we are a superpower 
because our geography made us a superpower. That's how that happened. It was just a geographical question. It wasn't brilliance or anything like that or talent. It was geography. Anyway, so um, the Department of War's official number was that it took five M4s. The M4 was also known as the Sherman. So five US tanks to destroy one German Panther. And what I mean by that is if the five, the five US tanks had to engage at the same exact ta time, it wasn't one at a time. Because if you did one at a time, you would just never defeat the Panther. And you'd rush it. And the thought was the Panther would destroy four of the tanks as it approached but it could only shoot American tanks so fast, the fifth tank would get behind the German tank where the armor was the thinnest and the engine was and put a round through it, through the engine. And that's how you took out a Panther. So in other words, the American strategy for fighting German tanks was you would lose four tanks with five-member crews. The Russians got the Sherman as Lend-Lease tank. They called it a coffin for five brothers, because it was a garbage tank, right? So that's what we're up against. And the Germans lost because they ran out of fuel. A tank that can't move is worthless. <laughs> and we could just walk up behind it with a grenade bundle, put it on the back end and walk away. There's nothing it can do, it's finished. And that's how they lost the Battle of Bulge. President Roosevelt flies to Egypt. He meets with the king of Saudi Arabia, January 1945, in the Suez Canal on a boat. And the reason why this matters is he looks at the Saudi royal family and he goes, we don't ever want to be in the position the Germans were in. The only thing we care about is that the oil flows. What are your terms to make sure the oil perpetually flows? At the time, the United States was the largest oil producer on the planet. But we knew already Saudi Arabia was going to be amazing. How? Well, there were these Texans in Saudi Arabia developing the Saudi oil fields going, you should see what we're looking at. This is going to be amazing. And that's why Roosevelt's there. He makes a deal with the Saudis that we will protect the Saudi royal family for all eternity from internal and external threats. In return, Saudi Arabia will make sure that the oil flows for all eternity. And that's the deal. Uh, also, a Ramco will be created and we'll get an air base in Dahran and we will have this permanent connection to the Saudis. So when the British approach Ro Truman in 1950, there are looking at the devil going, you know, hey, what do you say? Here's what Truman said. He said, no, the United States does not overthrow democracies. By the way, in, in terms of bold-faced lies, that was beautiful, right? Because we already had a history of overthrowing democracies. And it was, you know, like we had invaded uh, Honduras eight times, Nicaragua seven times, Guatemala four times when Truman said this, because we haven't done the fifth time yet. And the reason we did this wasn't for oil, it was for bananas. B bananas. Whenever, whenever Guatemala or Honduras would go crazy and get a democracy, they'd inevitably vote for politicians that would depeasantize the banana production and increase pay to the banana producers, which would drive up the price of bananas in the United States. And so we would send in the United States Marine Corps, shoot the place up, overthrow the government, replace it with um, a tyranny that we liked, a tyranny that we approved of, and then the price of bananas would be lowered. And now we're thinking, wait a minute, we could do this in the Middle East. By the way, it's where the term Banana Republic comes from. So that's a strange name for a fashion. I don't, I don't, I don't get it really. You, you named your fashion line after us overthrowing democracies to get cheap bananas. So, okay, well done, well done in name selection. <clears throat> in 1953, the CIA will overthrow the Iranian government. And of course, the consequences are catastrophic. 
It's why we're in the situation that the world is in right now. It's why Iran appears to be in yet another revolution that's been going on for over a year now, and it doesn't look like that revolution is going away anywhere, anytime soon. Right? The consequences are still haunting us today. The United States' policies toward the Middle East, of course, I could throw in Iraq, which was a catastrophe, destabilized the world, destabilized Europe. Uh, it just the list goes on, but I'm running out of time. So, in Texas right now, I told you we've been having 43, 44 degree days, which I think is hilarious for a place that has been in denial about global warming for decades. There is, period, there's no doubt we've known about global warming as a serious threat to our species since at least 1987. Right? There's, no con there's no conversation you can have that says that we had any doubt by 1987. So what had to happen was our political class in the United States, especially, but the whole planet, had to go along with this idea that somehow we were going to deny the science, the science that was overwhelming, it was well established, and we had to do it for decades. The United States just passed the, the Inflation Reduction Act. It's its first attempt, serious attempt, at trying to do something about global warming, and it's probably 1% of what we should have done. In other words, it's in a, it is, a 1% is great compared to 0%, but compared to 100%, it makes me feel like, wow, this is the best we could do. We're the richest country on the planet. Surely we care about our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren. Surely we care about our children. What, what, what are our children's life expectancies now because of this? So here we are, we're in the midst of this mind-numbing heat wave. And I can't tell you how many people are complaining, going, man, maybe global warming was such a bad idea after all. And it feels like we created this situation on purpose. We should have been doing something before now. We knew about it. And then people will say, when you confront them, they'll say, well, I didn't know. How did you not know? Right? In the midst of Al Gore's attempts and all the activists that were rolling up their sleeves and fighting and struggling, how could you not know? And the answer is, one of the problems that we have in the United States especially, but I suspect the whole planet has that to a degree, is that our politician class is motivated by not just greed, but getting re-elected. And we had ExxonMobil <coughs> funding the denial side of the equation and trashing people and talking about how these scientists were bad scientists and how the science wasn't clear and going on and on and spending billions of dollars that they could have been spending on research to get us out of the nightmare on trying to brainwash us into going along with it. And then, of course, in, the, in a country like the United States, our politicians are elected through campaign financing. So if you're a politician and you don't do what the rich want, then the money that you need to run your campaign in two years is gone, and they'll fund the other guy, and he'll take you out. And so in a really tragic way, what we've allowed is these corporations to have too much influence over our democracy. Uh, I realize that most of, the country, most of the world's democracies have figured this out and don't allow that kind of dirty money. That dirty money is all we have in the United States. We even had a Supreme Court ruling in 2010 that made that dirty money legal. It's Citizens United, in case you want to look up the Supreme Court ruling. 2000, January 2010, Citizens United case. It basically just allowed unlimited donations to politicians. And so what's happened is, in the United States, the political class is literally owned by these corporations, including ExxonMobil. One of the great tragedies is ExxonMobil, its original company, was destroyed. Its original company was Standard Oil. President Theodore Roosevelt decided he didn't want it anymore. And he went after it. He actually went after other corporations too, but that's the famous one he went after. And they broke it up into seven companies. And one of those companies took as its new name, Mobil, um, one of those companies took as its new name, S-O, standing for Standard Oil, but without actually being called Standard Oil anymore. And then advertisers went, it looks like so. It's a terrible, it's a terrible name. You need to jazz it up somehow. So they decided to spell it out 
S-O, E-S-S-O. And so S-O, the letter S-O became S-O. And then in the 50s, advertisers went, S's are great, but you know what's better? X's. And so they branded the company in the United States, they rebranded it X-On, with two X's in the middle. And then a few, two, what was it, two decades ago, Exxon purchased mobile. It is purchased four of the, five, the seven pieces. So Exxon Mobile is standard oil reconstituted. The monster came back, it's alive, and it's dominated. <laughs> At one point, it was the, th the fourth largest economy on the planet. It went United States, uh, at the time, United States, Japan, Federal Republic of Germany, Exxon Mobil, Republic of France, United Kingdom. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so I guess I want to wrap this up by leaving you with a thought, which is this. I, when I look into the future, I can see how energy and energy technology could be a force of liberation, because think about it. How would I have gotten here without an airplane? without a car. The, the way we produce food on the planet, I looked up this number, I got three different answers, and the way we produce food in the United States is for every 10 calories we spend, we get one calorie in food back. So think about it, we literally couldn't make that amount of food if we didn't have petroleum, if we didn't have some form of energy that we could put into a farm field. Because if, if it was up to humans to do it, we don't want to have a, a 10 to 1 ratio. We, we want it the other way. By the way, gathering and hunting was the other way. It, for every calorie you spent, you got 10 calories back. So we're in the opposite of gathering and hunting. Now for every 10 calories we spend, we get one calorie back. So our, all energy has the potential to liberate. The problem is, at what point do we make decisions, bad decisions like we made in Iraq or Iran? At what point do we make decisions where we've subjugated future generations to our own desire to have convenient lives? Uh, in a really strange twist, we've enslaved future generations to our decisions right now. Because no matter what happens going forward, they're stuck dealing with the nightmare we've inflicted on the planet. And so, I guess, conferences like this are really critical, because not only are you problem-solving new energy issues, you're problem-solving ways to not keep messing up. But I do have to say, as a Texan, this last summer, I feel like really kind of brought home the message without having activists constantly shouting it in people's faces. <laughs> anyway, I, thank you for letting me do this, uh, and I really appreciate what you're here doing. So. It means a lot to me to have been part of it. <clears throat> uh, professor, thank you very much for an astounding keynote speech and reminding us that um, there are many, many uh, events before us defining our current situation and I would say presence as such. Um, are you still up for a few questions yes. from the audience, yeah. from the screen, from sure. the moderator? <laughs> no, I, listen, I'm now really seriously deciding upon shall I become a vegetarian. <laughs> and if we decide today to skip, even though the meals with meat were ordered for our lunch break, <laughs> would the impact be really um, as effective if we mainly or predominantly choose um, that way of lifestyle? So being vegetarian? I'm definitely not an expert in this, but I'll, I'll tell you what I know of the situation. So first of all, you'd have to ha come up with some sort of protein supplement that was reliable and inexpensive that could replace meat, because when we sw transitioned from being uh, herbivores to omnivores, we mm -hmm. became reliant on some amount of meat. Yeah. And the, the big brain that we grow and the proteins that we need require that. It exists that those, those alternative proteins exist. I don't know how you feed 8 billion people with them. Meat is just cheaper and easier to get to. I think the problem isn't whether or not we choose to have a meat or a meat-free diet. The problem is we overconsume. So I know that the United States is sort of the outlier in the mm -hmm. data set. 
Um, you know, the United States is probably consuming almost twice the calories it needs to be. Obesity is through the roof. Um, diabetes is through the roof. We also have really high cancer rates, and I think overconsumption of meat has been linked to high cancer rates. Um, in the United States, I think Americans will eat 20 meals of meat a week. You probably need one. And so I think if you got rid of some of the consumption of meat, you could have an impact. Um, in the United States, the way we used to do agriculture was the technology that the Arabs came up with for agriculture uh, between, somewhere between 750 and 800 mm -hmm, AD mm -hmm. when they did the agriculture revolution, which is you do crop rotation. So you grow legumes, you grow grain, and, and then you, grow, and you have an animal. By, and then you rotate. Well, doing that meant that the animal was an integral part of fertilizing the soil. Today, what they do in the United States is you, the animals are in feedlots, and then there's a farm that sells the grain to the feedlots. The and reason is because of the subsidies. You can't get the subsidy if the, if the animal's on your farm, so you have to sell the animal off to get the subsidy. So we've incentivized creating a system where the, the waste material from the animals is now toxic and contaminates our water, but then it also means that now the, the guys making the food have to get factory-made yes. fertilizer. And so, the, so what's happened is we've seen a decline in the way the agriculture is produced, and in the, at the same time we're seeing this massive energy waste to produce that kind of agriculture. How many of you in the room now will choose and opt for a vegetarian meal today at lunch break? But be honest. Okay. So <laughs> we're not proponing any lifestyles, <laughs> just so you know, but, you know, trying to keep it ecologically and decarbonized all the way. Uh, some questions are here uh, for the audience. You can ask the question, but we do not have too much time, so maximum one to two questions from the audience. A wonderful lady, all dressed in green with a microphone. I kindly ask her to wave a uh, hand with a microphone. Voila, we have already a first question. Audience, uh, you have an opportunity to Thank ask. Thank you. Uh, I'll use your political scientist brain for this question. <laughs> I think it's most interesting. So we, we don't have any doubt that corporations are running policy. How do you see impact on that process of social media and artificial intelligence? Easy one for a start. Uh, okay. Social media, I don't know how social media looks in the, in, outside of the United States because I'm just, you know, like I know you can post from anywhere. But, you know, when I look at the, Stritter, the Twitter stream, I know it's not Twitter anymore, but I don't care. XX. Yeah, whatever. It's <laughs> not X on mobile. Uh, <laughs> When I look at it, I just see noise. I don't see information. I see people screaming at each other. Yeah. I don't see the point. There's no conversation taking place. Uh, people are reading the, the posts they either want to scream at or the ones that they already agree with. So I don't have any hope for social media. Um, AI it could potentially be a good thing, right? Because that's the thing with all technology. It has the potential to liberate uh, I've, I've grown up on sci-fi, and every single sci-fi ever, the AI will eventually become sentient and, and wipe us out. And I think part of that is our, is our subconscious mind feeling guilt for all the labor we systematically exploit, and we see AI and robots as, as part of that. So maybe we're projecting you know, the past of slavery, the past of having a worker class that we don't pay enough, and we're scared that at some point there'll be a, a revolution. I mean, certainly we, 100 years ago, we had an attempt in Russia to make that revolution happen. Um, and then, you know, I know at some point, Bosnia was part of that, although not as Bosnia specifically. Um, in any case, uh, I'm going to say something that I already know you'll hate. Nuclear! <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I just think... There are so many options on the table right now. The problem isn't the, what to do. The problem is somehow convincing the general public to put enough pressure on the politicians that they, for a moment, stop listening to the corporations and do the thing. In, what, in Texas, what happened was our governor, a conservative Republican, a climate change denier, you know, like the, the, the mix of everything you didn't want to see, and he became governor in 2001, his name is Rick Perry, the guy who said he would get rid of the Department of Energy because he didn't want energy regulation if he ever became president. 
He's the guy who put in our windmills. Like, he was, he, you would think he would never have done that. And the reason was profit motive. He realized Texas was going to make a bunch of money off of this. And he, and he thought, okay, this makes sense, profit motive. Uh, and, but I also think if the public will start to act to put pressure on their politicians, that's, that's probably the most important thing. While you were giving your answer, I've asked your question to chat GPT. <laughs> Make sure to go and check the answer. <laughs> you would love it. You would love it. Let's focus uh, on one question here, and then we would definitely have to wrap up. I love this. It's not an anonymous. It's E equals MC squa square. Yeah. Uh, why did the Seven Sisters prevent the development of electromobility in the world for so long? Seven Sisters being seven big companies, uh, United... Oil. Uh, oil, oil companies, okay. Yeah. Seven Sisters, okay. So uh, that I just had this conversation with my family on the plane over. At one point, um, we did have electric cars in the United States uh, in the 1980s. We had electric cars. Um, California was building electric car hubs. There, there was like it was a thing, and people were buying into it, and then it went away. And it went away without even a conversation. It just evaporated, and then all of a sudden, now here we are you know, 30 years later, and it's like, ooh, electric cars. And I, I, I think it just boils down to the oil companies went in there and spent the money they needed to and just killed the electric car. It, it was just that simple. If you go to a city like Houston, Houston, Texas, it's the fourth largest city in the United States, which isn't especially large on the global scale, right? There's probably 100 cities bigger than that in China. Um, but, but still, for the United States, it's a, it's a big city. Its urban sprawl footprint is a nightmare. The, the city is just spread out. Yeah. So even though it's the fourth largest city in the United States, and there's 100 cities at least larger than that in the world, um, I, in terms of how much acreage, I wouldn't be surprised if it's actually the largest city on the planet. It, it's incredible. We used to have a train, and that train... <laughs> when you think about it, w made a lot of sense for a city that's so spread out. You want to have something like that. In the 1950s, GM went to Houston and it literally bought off the city council and it said, switch over to buses. And they did. They switched over to buses so that GM could sell the buses. I mean, there, this, is the, this has been the problem our entire existence, I think, of the 20th century, I should say, uh, is that we will make good decisions but only if we have a way to silence the, the corporate interests, only if we can ignore them. And, and that, the electric car is a classic example. Imagine if we had been using them for 30 years instead of, what, five? We have some super fine models exposed here nearby. Okay. I guess we should all go for an experimental ride. Professor, thank you so thank much you. for a great lecture. Thanks. A Q&A session as well. We have a little memorabilia for you, and okay. it's a nice photo opportunity. I will ask our charming and kind ladies to hand over the memorabilia to you as a sign of appreciation so on much. behalf of Zeteor. Thank you. Thanks. All the best. Much appreciated. Take care.